How you doing, Zach? I'm doing great, especially now that I get to talk to, you know, one of the architects of my, my VHS filled uh, childhood. <laughs> I was a VHS kid. I was born in 91. And, you know, there were a handful, a big handful of movies that were just always in and out of my VHS. And one of them was Back to the Future. All right. Um, and being a VHS kid, my Back to the Future ended with the message to be continued. Right. So right. Uh, maybe you can you can say whether or not, uh, you know, the, the 4K 35th anniversary that we're talking about uh, has that. Or, um, you know, were you opposed to when they added that? Or is it kind of like, eh, whatever? No, no, no. The, the story about how that got added was, remember, in, in, uh, in 19, whenever, when, when did that come out on VHS? Probably uh, 87 um, was, was when it was released, 86 or 87. And this was how we announced that there was going to be a Back to the Future Part 2. So we made the first movie. We had no idea if anybody was even going to go to the theater. We thought that they would, but, um, and even if they did go to the theater, we were not thinking sequel because making the first movie was such a grueling experience that all we wanted to do was get the movie finished and get it into theaters. And we were not thinking about, about a reprise. So uh, by the time it was time for it to come out on, home video, uh, we had decided that there was going to be a sequel, and what better way to announce it than to put to be continued at the end of the videotape. Mm -hmm. So when the movie was finally released on DVD in, when was this, 2002, um, we decided to take that off. Uh, and every video release subsequent has had, has had to be continued at the end of part one removed because it was never really there uh, in the theatrical release. And I can't tell you how many people have sworn to me up and down that they saw that in the theater and it said to be continued. Right. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, memories, memories, the second thing to go. And I can't remember the first. <laughs> So I want you to take me back a little bit. Um, you know, you and it's so funny, you know, having seen this movie and passed it, having passed it down to so many, you know, kids that I've just, you know, watched or just ran into randomly, <laughs> you know, uh, parents and stuff are, are sometimes taken aback at how, you know, the movie, Back to the Future's got some edge to it. It's got some kick. It's got some spice. Let's yep. see if you bastards can take 90. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, but it's also definitely like a step back, uh, in terms of that content from like used cars. Did you, did you do this as like counter programming to that script? Uh, tell me a little bit about the tone. Well, well, sure. I mean, used cars was hard R, um, and that's what our intention was. And the subject matter just determined that there was no reason for this to be an R rated movie. If you're gonna if you're gonna make an R-rated movie, just like if you're gonna watch HBO, um, you know you want to see uh, women with their tops off. Uh, you want to hear lots of profanity um, because that's what you're paying for, right? It says R, I want the R experience. Um, <laughs> PG, uh, well, no, we're not gonna give you an R experience. Now, is there edge to it? Yeah, there is. Um, is it a family picture? Yeah but it's a family picture with edge because we thought, okay, um, even Disney's uh, animated stuff has edge. I mean, Dumbo gets drunk. Um, that fabulous pink elephant scene, you know, one of the greatest scenes of all time, Dumbo is drunk. You know, the crows are smoking cigars. Um, you have, uh, you know, the Pinocchio, the scene when the kids get transformed into donkeys, that's horrific. And, and those kids are smoking cigars. I mean, it's edgy, it's dark, um, and it's rated G uh, today. So uh, these are movies that Bob and I grew up on, 
uh, all the classic Disney stuff. And so we thought to ourselves, you know what? Um, we're not going to talk down to our kids that go see this. We, we don't want to talk down to our audience. Um, we'll, we'll talk to them like we would talk to each other and figure that they will figure it out. And if there's stuff that goes over their head, okay. Yeah, when you're nine years old, you're not thinking that Biff is actually going to rape Lorraine when he gets into that car. But, you know, when you see it now, it's kind of creepy. But it needs to be creepy because if it isn't, then the moment when George rescues Lorraine isn't as powerful. So these were things that we were very conscious of. We're gonna we're gonna have Doc Brown machine gun to death uh, at the Twin Pines Mall. It's powerful. It's horrifying. Um, it's something that you know you don't want your four year old to see it. Great. It's PG, parental guidance. Your four-year-old isn't supposed to see it. Um, <laughs> but it makes such an indelible impression on Marty McFly that he's seen his best friend get machine gunned to death that it informs everything that happens in the second half of the movie. Marty's got to figure out, how am I going to save Doc's life? And if that scene wasn't as horrific as it is, it wouldn't be as powerful. So yeah, it's edgy. And I think a, a, about a year ago, there was a very good article in the Atlantic Monthly uh, where somebody was bemoaning the fact that today's family films are not like Back to the Future and Goonies and some of the other uh, 80s family films that had edge to them, uh, where people do die or get hurt or we're actually going there, but it's still intended for a more general audience. And uh, things are too car compartmentalized. Somebody asked me if I thought whether Back to the Future could get made today uh, as it was. And the thing that I think about is that the relationship between Marty and Doc which you completely buy in the movie. Today, studio executives would be overthinking that and say, wait, wait, is, is, is Doc a pedophile here? Why, why is he hanging out with this kid? Why is this kid hanging out with Doc? Well, the, nothing of the sort, of course, not one iota of that. Because um, when you see the movie and you just kind of get, okay, um, these are both kind of rebellious characters who feel a connection with each other. And there's nothing else beyond that other than Marty thinks Doc is this really cool guy. And Doc thinks, hey, Marty's this, this kid that, you know, maybe I can give him something. He's, he's the son I never had. Um, he's, he's inquisitive. He doesn't judge me. Um, and that's what their relationship is based on, mutual respect. Totally. Uh, I want to jump forward a little bit to um, the future proofing of Back to the Future 2. You know, uh, some stuff happened, some stuff didn't happen by 2015. Um, obviously, we don't have flying cars. Um, we do pretty much have Biff uh, in charge of stuff, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, but well, that was not that was not 2015. That was 1985A. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but um can you talk a little bit about you know taking that approach of like some of this stuff is going to be plausible but some of the stuff we're just going to go we're just going to run wild and have fun with that was our that was our um those those were the orders marching orders we gave ourselves because we said nobody ever predicts the future correctly it's not going to happen so instead of us trying to predict the future correctly let's not be unaware of what people think the future might be like, but let's just have fun with it. Wouldn't it be cool at this? Wouldn't it be cool at that? Hoverboards were a way of us saying, what would a skateboard of the future be like? So we were always using the iconography of the first movie to say, how would we do this in the second movie? 
So we've got two dinner table scenes in the first movie. That means we got to have a dinner table scene in part two. And what kind of goofy stuff could we have? Well, uh, pizza hydrator. That would be crazy. That would be fun. Um, nobody's ever seen that before. Um, it's kind of it's kind of unfortunate that we don't have uh, uh, food hydrators today. Uh, and I don't think anybody's working on them. But on the other hand, we thought, okay, video conferencing, that was something that people were talking about. We show that. And <laughs> what are we doing? The same thing that, that Marty and Needles were doing here. Um, you know, we're doing it on our computers, our tablets, not on our TV, but it's not, it's really not any different. So yeah, we, we knew that some stuff would be right. We knew some stuff would be wrong. Um, the one thing that we knew for sure we would get right was that people in 2015 would be nostalgic about the 1980s. Um, that was an easy call. Uh, so yeah, we have cafe 80s uh, uh, in, in various locales in America. Uh, people, people want to relive the 80s today. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, to the chagrin of executives here and there, you and Bob, uh, Bob Zemeckis have been very protective of this property. Um, it's funny, I recently uh, interviewed uh, the writer of um, Bill and Ted, uh, post Back to the Future uh, time travel movie. Uh, and they similarly, uh, when they were trying to get their third movie made, um, you know, they were constantly being told, why don't you reboot it instead? Well, we can work on a reboot. We would rather do a reboot than a sequel. Uh, and it was such a hassle to get their movie made. And I imagine that, you know, every year or so around October 21st, someone, you know, shows up, sends you an email, goes, hey, we want to go to Reboot City. Are you in? And you've all constantly said no. Tell me a little bit about, you know, being so protective of this trilogy. Well, for one thing, when, when, when Michael J. Fox was, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, you know, that, that put a major nail in that, in, in, in that idea um, to just say, no, um, that's not, you don't want to do Back to the Future movie without Michael J. Fox. So that that just took that took so much off the table. Um, then you know, yeah, what about a reboot? Well, why? Um, uh, you know, if you want to do somebody else wants to do a time travel movie, be my guest. Uh, what's stopping you? Um, but if you're going to call it Back to the Future, no, we're not going to do that because Back to the Future means so much so many people and to call it back to the future or not to involve Michael J. Fox. Um, I mean, Bill and Ted, they had, they had the, they had the original guys. Uh, we can't, we couldn't do that even if we wanted to, which we don't, but we feel that with back to the future three, we said everything that we wanted to say. Um, both Marty and doc have grown as people. Um, we have the comic book series for people that want more Back to the Future that spins off a lot of, of stuff from the movies and tells some backstories and uh, tells how Doc invented a time train and, and lots of other interesting tales. Um, so that's a good medium for that sort of thing. But um, and we, in the video game, we set a really high bar for ourselves. Yes, the video game as well. Um, we set a really high bar for ourselves. And, you know, we've seen movies where they go back to the well uh, one too many times or two or three too many times. <laughs> and people are just kind of, uh, um, we don't want to do a money grab. Um, you know, they, they always say, hey, you guys can make a whole lot of money. I'll say, well, yeah, okay. But we've got a lot of money. Um, <laughs> we're not going to sell, we're not going to sell our children into prostitution here. It's just not right. Instead, we've done Back to the Future, the musical. And we've taken the essence of Back to the Future, the story of Back to the Future, and we translated it into a stage musical. And I will tell you, it is fabulous. Um, I've been involved with it from the very beginning. I wrote the book. I attended all rehearsals, all workshops. I worked with the director and the cast, uh, with uh, with Alan Silvestri and Glenn Ballard uh, to get the songs right. Um, the director, John Rando. Um, it's all 
the production people. Um, the play, the, the musical, it is really a wonderful celebration of Back to the Future. If you're a Back to the Future fan, you will love it. Even if you're not that big of a Back to the Future fan, you'll still love it. We had people attend in Manchester who, believe it or not, had never even seen the movie. I didn't think that was possible, but there were at least six people who came up to me and said, I didn't see the movie, but this is so good. I loved every minute of this. So there you go. This is how we will keep Back to the Future uh, living on for, for audiences around the world. That, that's awesome. I mean, that is a, a um, coronavirus uh, PSA. Put on your mask <laughs> so I can finally watch that musical. Bring it to Broadway. I live in New York. I want to see it. Well, let's get Broadway back up and running. Let's get New exactly. York back up and running. That mm -hmm. has to happen first. <laughs> All right, so I've got I've got a couple of, of quick rapid fires, and then I'm going to let you go because I know you've got places to go, people to see, things to do. Um, exactly. This is very important. Uh, I was asked by multiple people to ask this: Does Doc Brown's mind reading device work? No. Okay. No. Okay. It does not. No. And he says it. This damn thing doesn't work at all. <laughs> um, what? I, I I already know what you're going to say, but. What does the flux capacitor actually do? Well, a capacitor is, is an electrical device that stores energy and then releases it at a particular moment. Um, what is the flux aspect of this capacitor? Um, I can't tell you that because if somebody figured out how to build one, you know, the, the entire space-time continuum could be at risk. Fair enough, fair enough. You're, you're doing God's work. Um, <laughs> and, and, and last thing, just really quick. Uh, I think it's my favorite take in just in cinema is Doc Brown saying that he's got to send Marty back to the future. He looks directly at the camera and then he just glazes off and looks into the <laughs> distance. It's such a meta... I don't know, is that you? Is that Chris? Is that uh, Zemeckis? What is like the magic of that, that just little tiny moment that you might not even notice? You know what, it's all the above. I would say that extra little moment, that's Chris. That's pure Chris. Because we sh shot that several times. I mean, you know, the blocking, it's class Zemeckis. You know, people moving back and forth in space. You see that. Totally. In, in all of Zemeckis' movies. That's how he, he he's adds dynamism to what would otherwise be a static camera shot. Um, but, you know, Chris would always do something interesting in every take, and it was always right. And the editors would always say, we have an embarrassment of, of riches here, because anything that Doc did, that Chris did, that was a little bit off or a little different, it still worked. So. You know, at some point, you know, Bob and the editors are looking at these takes in the, in the cutting room and, you know, Bob would have said, that's the one, that's it, put that in the movie. <laughs> well, Bob, this has been a real treat for me. Um, you know, I said it before, you are an architect of an entire generation in many ways. Um, I appreciate that, thank you. And, you know, 35 years, finally getting a, a big, you know, 4K. I still got to get a 4K TV, but that's another whole other thing. But They're really um, cheap now. Right? That's They're what they really keep on telling cheap. me. I got to tell you, my, listen, my, my TV in my bedroom blew up, literally. I, I turned it on and <laughs> there was a spark. And, and this, was an old, this was an old plasma TV that I've had for nine or 10 years. Uh, and you know, I said to my wife, "Okay, time to get it. Time to get a new one." Uh, we got a we got a Samsung, seven hundred dollars, uh, and it's unbelievable how sharp and wonderful it is. Sixty five inches, it's it's terrific. So yeah, yeah, spend the money. You it's you, you know it's like the lights come on. Uh, you, you'll see how how clear these things are. But then for, you know for a four K to get the max out of a 4k disc well you need a 4k player too 
Um, yeah. But one at a time, get the TV first. Sure. It's, they're great and they're cheap. <laughs> and uh, this interview now uh, unofficially sponsored by Samsung. <laughs> All right, so Samsung, okay. if you're listening, give me a TV. Uh, all right, well, thanks so much. Yeah, it's been so amazing to talk to you. And, uh, you know, I'll catch you on the next one. All right, see you in the future, Zach. See you at the uh, Broadway premiere of Back to the Future, the musical, or come to London and see us over there. You won't be sorry. Definitely. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.